Hello? Hello there, I see you. You're Hi. live. Hi. I am sort of alive. <laughs> this is not my thing really, but I yeah, I had a different on my calendar. It, they must have changed the um, the the link because it. I I was sitting there by myself and wondering, but they're supposed to have started already. So when I go into my calendar and I click on the link I had from previous ones, it um didn't work right. Oh well. Yeah, we 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 changed it this semester. I think Mike changed it uh, from from last. I, he had some reasons for that and. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's, that's why I sent the link out yesterday, so everybody can you know, at least, if they go back their emails, they can have it. I'm gonna. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a brief introduction uh, for those of you because we're taping this for YouTube and people will be watching it later as well. But um, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction and just a few things. Uh, I'd like to talk, you know, about your background, and your educational background, and your expertise. Just about, it will only take two minutes. And then the rest of the time, obviously, you have, uh, I'd like to end somewhere around, uh, you know, 250 ish. But, uh, you know, if you go 40 minutes, whatever, we have some time for questions and answers and stuff. If people want to stick around after, that's up to you. Uh, Mike's going to put this on 20 second delay for YouTube. So we're good to go. Thank you for doing this, by the way. I know you're very busy. Yeah a lot of the, uh, the things that you're working on and uh, we appreciate this very much. Yeah, I'm enjoying it as well. Kind of feel like I'm with an apartment. It's bizarre, the Zoom thing, but. <laughs> uh, Bob won't be joining us because um, we both can't be on the uh, internet on Zoom at the same time our system crashes, so. I understand. He's in the background somewhere. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm yeah. doing this live. Here I am live, but uh, by yourself. I'm in thirty. Yeah, I'm in thirty eighteen, but there's no one here. It's so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm live because <laughs> we're mandated to be live. I don't know. I'm live, so we're good. We're good. As long as we're alive, live. <laughs> right. That's, uh... I feel sometimes that I'm a. Uh, very close to not being that alive, alive. <laughs> yeah, things are pretty crazy. It, it, this whole thing about learning all this new technology has been very difficult um, for me. And you know, Stephen uh, Mullins has, has been helping me out so much, and he's he's a wonderful human being. So, yep. We we need our consultants, and Mike Simonovich is uh, Simonovich is a, is, a, is a, a wizard on this stuff. So I'm, I'm yeah. very appreciative of his help. I know it's amazing how technology is really ramped up. You know, the big shift from people going on the internet to all of us, you know, email, and now all of a sudden everything's virtual and high flex. <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm a Luddite. I don't like technology really. Just what I need to like, what I need to use. And then I have to use other things. And yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm getting used to it. Uh, I'm doing a class, uh, Independence IDS 2935 Quest course. And uh, most of my class is watching it remotely while I give it live, but I have two or three students in a room, it's crazy. It's, it's very different. Is it hard to keep them engaged, the ones who are on, online? It, I think it is. I think it's it's a challenge. And it's, uh, I bring props, of course. I'll bring a guitar in or, or props some kind of things to cut, you know, keep them alive, awake, whatever, but uh, it's all good. We got two minutes good. left. It'll go by fast and then I'll get an introduction when Mike uh, gives me the word here. And uh, then we'll let her roll. We see a lot of people joining in right now. Okay, good. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Okay. You know, it was interesting. I was trying to see if I could uh, do the presenter view. I don't think you can do the presenter view because then you all see my presenter view since I share a screen. It's kind of crazy that way. Yeah, when you share your screen, I'm going to move your screen over so so people that were uh, here, if there was anybody here, could see it. But 
Okay. Yes, yeah, Cynthia, as soon as you uh, click share screen, uh, as a co-host, you'll be able to take over what's on the screen. So I just have your flyer up for uh, as a placeholder until you're ready to do that. Right, but when I share my screen, if I do presenter view, you all see presenter view. Right? Uh, That's right, Cynthia. If you only have a single screen, you have to share your, your display mode. Okay. Okay, I think I can handle not seeing my notes somehow, <laughs> but that's okay. And also when I hit to watch, to uh, go to, um, go to the uh, presentation, it kind of takes my whole screen. I tried to make it smaller and it didn't work that way. Oh, well, never mind. I got it. Okay, it's, I believe it's three o'clock. Are we ready to roll, Mike? Okay, you say she's gonna let me know. Okay, we're live and recording. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the third in our series, the colloquium series from the Department of Geography. And uh, we are very happy to have our distinguished scholar with us today who is in our department, Associate Professor, Dr. Cynthia Simmons. And um, give you a little background of Dr. Simmons. She has a bachelor's in Latin American studies, an MA in international affairs, 1993, a master's of science in urban and regional planning, 1995, and a degree, a, a doctoral degree, a PhD in geography from all of which came from Florida State University, 1999. Her focus areas are global environment. She's interested in the political economy and she's inter interested in social change. Uh, she's published volumes and volumes of papers, referee journal articles on these topics. And we welcome her today. We're very excited to have her talking about Amazonia. Take her away, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, it's great to uh, have a chance to interact with all of you, although I have to admit this Zoom kind of mechanism is, is odd, um, but we're here and we're all sort of in virtual space um, and I'm happy to have a chance to share my research. Um, it's also kind of ironic that I'm talking about the Amazon and I'm looking at a half frozen Lake Michigan. Um, we have the highest day, I think today it's gonna to be 33 degrees, although it's dropping down to three degrees uh, tomorrow. So. Um, We've been having a fascinating time watching the water freeze on the lakes. I've never seen that happen. It's quite fascinating. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna to talk about the Amazon. Um, we are living in a crazy time. Um, as we all know, not just in terms of uh, the politics that we deal with, but just in general, that things have been really uh, quite bizarre. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, I have a dog. I'm sorry if he barks. <laughs> Hold on a second while I mute. In terms of uh, screen sharing. Am I being allowed to show the screen? Okay. Uh, you are the co-host, so you should be able to, yes. There we go. I kind of. The bad go. thing about that, it started out with my last picture and that was kind of like the punchline. But anyway, uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Like I said, I'll be talking about the Amazon. Um, it's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy several years, not just here in the US, uh, but also around the world uh, in Brazil and in the Amazon. 
Um, it's been really uh, crazy. Those of us who uh, have been focused on Amazon, uh, you see uh, Amazon has its highest in, in decades across the new CNN, wildfires burning in Honduras and across the Amazon. At the same time, you've got flooding uh, occurring um, in 2018. And of course, now we have the pandemic and the indigenous populations and the rural populations in the Amazon have been really hit the hardest. And this has been a topic that I've been uh, thinking about quite a bit. I've had a chance to, to talk to colleagues of course, here's my punchline. You have you know, the two presidents of our countries as well. It's been kind of crazy. Uh, what does the future hold? Um, it's really hard to tell, but um, given these issues, there, I've been invited to talk at a number of international symposiums and workshops, really all focused on you know, how can we explain what's happening in Amazon today? Uh, what lessons you know, can, we, can we learn from the past in order to, uh, understand the future. You know, all these things happening, you know, the question is why? How are they happening? Um, this it comes my title, uh, Dynamic Amazonia, and in particular, looking back to see forward. I've been working in the Amazon region for over 25 years, got it seems like just yesterday, um, and I have seen some dramatic changes since I came out with my development degree in the 1990s, um, you know, how can we make sense of it? Well, we can look at how things have changed from the 1960s to today. You know, population in the Amazon's grown tenfold. You've got smallholders, you've got indigenous, traditional, but you also have a very large, the largest population there really are uh, family farmers in the rural areas and urban dwellers in cities of, you know, more than, you know, 1.5 million people. So the region has changed dramatically. The economy. Um, if you would have told people back in the 1980s that livestock would be the most productive economy in the Amazon, they would have thought you were crazy because of the environment. But now we have livestock and we have soy, uh, which they would have also thought was kind of crazy. But the vast mineral wealth and the industrial potential in the Amazon is really quite breathtaking. The environment has uh, changed. There's been degradation, but there's been changes, more developed, built up landscapes versus the natural landscapes. So it really depends on how you look at the environment in, in that regard. Infrastructure, you know, roads basically opened up the Amazon, but since then the magnitude of road building and infrastructure has really been quite startling. Um, really that's probably what caused or what gave the impetus for the economy to grow so greatly. Um, but today the magnitude of these changes and the way these infrastructure changes are taking place really I see as, it, as one of the, the larger environmental and social threats to the Amazon today. But you really have to look at it in its magnitude. And so here is a stopping. So I decided to show a snap, and I'm sure uh, Mike is probably cringing to see him out there. He helped me put this together as, as well as Ghani. And this was the, this is the big, huge, integrated infrastructure for South America that um, has been ongoing since 2000. And really it's an integrated plan to create a multimodal tra transportation hub to stimulate global, the global economy, their market economy. And it involves uh, multi-scalar planning efforts. There's planning at the nation state level uh, and cooperation between nation states within uh, South America, within the Amazon, nation state projects, projects being done at the state level and projects being done at the local level. And what this do is massive infrastructure project. Um, and there's these cumulative and synergistic impacts that is gonna bring and expand development uh, into the Amazon region. Um, and this is what I think is, is a real problem uh, and probably one of the challenges for the future. And what is going to happen. So these are plans uh, and these plans have been in the making at least since 2000. And so, you know, the Amazon today, I think it is a real concern. We have this uh, movement or had this movement of this blue political tide as conservative presidents uh, began occupying uh, positions of 
you have rising violence against environmentalists, you know, against uh, you know, agrarian reform activists, against indigenous peoples, indigenous lands and conservation areas are threatened, being downsized. Deforestation is inching up, wildfires are blazing as we talked about. And so really what I'm gonna focus on today is the uh, threat from this large scale infrastructure project. Um, and really how did we get here? When I showed that image to colleagues at various conferences and, and workshops, um, I had one of two responses. One was, oh my God, look at the magnitude of those projects. How did that happen? And the second was, oh yeah, it's never gonna happen. You know, those nations, they always have these big projects. You know, they, you know, the, the Cararo Dam, which, basically turned into the Pelamonchi Dam. You know, they defeated that in the 1980s. They're never gonna do this. Well, here we are and you know, the dams are going forward and these projects are going forward. And so what I'm gonna talk about is, well, how did we get here today um, and explain how it happened? It's really not really a surprise. And two, uh, yeah, I think these nations can and they are moving forward. They had moving forward on these projects in the 1960s um, and just time for fruition. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so how do we make sense? And so, like I said, looking back to see forward. And so many of my colleagues uh, in our workshops were probably about the same age. Um, and when I was finishing, you know, when I was studying in college and finishing my degree, you know, we had amazing optimism. You know, the 1980s, you had democratic reforms, the constitution uh, gave rights to indigenous peoples, traditional peoples, the environment with Nosa Natareza was, um, you know, valued and there was agrarian reform. So there's reason for optimism. And then in the 1990s, you had the Rio Summit uh, and you have Agenda 21 and Agenda 21 was how we're going to move forward all the nation states have signed on and get away from these centralized modernist you know, projects of the state to sustainable development, you know, decentralized planning, not centralized planning. Um, and it was, it was really exciting. And then we had in 2000, this kind of peak political wave when all these uh, uh, socially conscious populist leaders took, took over. And there was real optimism, you know, the idea that another or a different globalization is even possible in the words of Milton Santos. I'm not sure what he would think today, uh, given the, the dynamics is in fact another Amazonia or another uh, globalization possible. So then I started thinking about, I began with dynamic Amazonia. So the idea is that Amazonia is changing, it's dynamic and that there's been all these changes. And so I put this actually more as a question, has in fact development changed over the years from the 1960s forward? Um, do we really see a shift from this modernist state development projects to these decentralized grassroots, local, you know, um, that type of project? So that was my question to look at. Um, and so today I wanna make three points. Actually, I gotta move, I can't see you guys up there. And my argument, in fact, when it comes to development, that actually there's been a great deal of continuity. It hasn't been dynamic. And so my first point is that the development rhetoric and the development discourse changed, but in fact, the development practice didn't. So you have this notion that there's a changing paradigm, but in reality, it didn't manifest. Second, the material practice of development vis-a-vis where are they making the investments? There's historical continuity. From the beginning to the end, they're invested the same. Uh, and third, um, looking at this uh, idea of um, sustainable, sustainability, the rhetoric, I want to make the point that in fact, it's been very strategic for development interests to have everyone refocused on the local and the decentralized planning. And I'm gonna explain that in particular with regards to the Tapajos River Valley and the projects that are going forward in the Tapajos River Valley. So these are the three points I wanna to make today. Okay. So first, development rhetoric changed, but development practice didn't change. So this is a busy uh, table. So these are all the plans that you the 1960s forward. They were centralized, top-down planning efforts, regional planning. The rhetoric 
uh, follow suit, you know, march for the West to, to you know, integrate so we don't you know, lose it. Uh, we're going to be able to you know, conquer our challenge if we all do it together. Um, this type of rhetoric, and they, it matched when you look at the projects. So what they say they're gonna do, actually the, the program, the funding actually went to those type of projects. It went to national and international integration. It's in their very early planning documents. <clears throat> Finance, uh, monies went towards a highway network, towards hydropower, power line projects, industrial growth. That was the, uh, the rhetoric, the discourse in the actual planning documents, and that's where the money was invested. So we look now at sustainable development, you know, 1990s onward. The idea is that it should be decentralized, local, bottom-up planning, since we've shifted our paradigm to sustainable development. And the rhetoric matches. So we have Nosa Natarez, I have Brazil in action, you have Advanced Brazil. But when you actually look at the programs, this 1988 creating a national access to integrate the Amazon and develop the Amazon, um, which is also in the plan specifically for the Amazon, really are the same objective to uh, integrate infrastructure in South America that basically in 2000 was established. So each of these projects, really the financial investments went towards national and international integration, highway network, hydropower, power lines, and industrial growth. So it's the same investment streams that were happening. Um, and more recently, so we have neo-socialism that really came with, you know, when uh, the presidents shifted to a populist presidents, the idea that there'll be social equity is gonna be the focus of development. And so we have all the uh, rhetoric does sound good, Brazil for everyone, development, inclusion, education, development, productivity, inclusion, but when you look at the plans, they're exactly the same. Uh, the plan for ordering the territory, uh, national regional development, uh, programs for acceleration, accelerating growth, and the money stream and the investments went to the exact same uh, uh, efforts. So national, international integration, highways, hydropower, power lines, and industrial growth. Um, and so just looking at what they actually you had the programs, you had the plans and the rhetoric, and then you have the actual programs that, where the investments were made. There is in fact um, the National Amazon Plan, National Sustainable Amazon Plan, and this specifically has sustainability in, in, its, in its name. And so I wanna look at this closely to see, you know, where did the funding streams go? Um, and you have to bear with me, I'm gonna be showing a few other tables with, with dollars in it. Um, so here again, my second point is that, you know, Material practice of their investments, historical continuity. So the sustainable Amazon plan does call for environmental management, social inclusion, sustainable production, infrastructure, but green infrastructure and new funding standards. Um, primarily the Amazon fund was developed for international interest to make investments in development um, in the Amazon. So I'm going to use data, I have Portugal and Silva 2017, I have the reference at the end. I'm actually working on collecting data and trying to update it, but um, they looked at Amazon development investments between 2011 and 2015, looking at similar things. I use their data in a little bit of a different way, uh, but it's a really interesting paper if you read Portuguese. Um, we look at 2011 and 2015, the government invested $199.4 billion during that four year period. So how much went to the Amazon? Well, the sustainable Amazon plan was uh, 33.3 billion. And so that's about 17% of the total amount. The others, however, and these are the three stream uh, sources of that funding for the Amazon, sustainable Amazon, other money, about 166 billion or 83% went to large scale infrastructure projects. Um, and yeah, whether it's coming from the National Economic Bank, uh, municipalities and states, uh, municipalities and states, most of their money comes from the government's plan for development. And most of the municipalities and state budgets, um, they, they do the same thing. So there's very little that goes to the, the larger uh, picture. But if we look at the Amazon Sustainable Pro Plan, this should be where we would expect 
the monies and the investments to come. And 17% of that total is not that bad. Um, so looking at the priority of infrastructure investments, these are the, uh, the funds. Primarily these projects, this source, oh, what happened? Sorry about that. Hello, okay. So the bottom two sources of funding, most of those projects went to infrastructure, energy, food, beverage industry, hydropower, these type of, those types of projects. Um, here where is where the majority of those things identified, clearly identified as sustainable came uh, through um, these FNAO funds. Um, and so I'm gonna look closely at those, those funds. If we were to look at, okay, 20 billion of that 199 billion, that's about 10% of total funding. But how much of this 20 billion went to sustainable development as we would think about it? And so here's some other data that I'm going to try to go through quickly. First, we have what they call the PRONAF, and that goes to the settlements, the uh, settlement projects that have been established in the, the Amazon to deal with agrarian reform. Um, I've done work, uh, my colleagues have done work, and for the most part in Hondonia and Pará, there's not much real sustainable development. Most of the projects are um, cattle ranching, in fact, from the research that I did with my colleagues, um, it's in the uh, World Development Paper 2010, 70% of uh, 750 households we visited um, in the Amazon, all were primary economic activity was livestock. And even though the plan said they should be doing um, environmental and sustainable, in reality, uh, they were doing livestock. The next is the sustainable Amazon plan, and that mostly went to livestock. And so there's also a number of uh, research articles that, that question how uh, sustainable really is livestock. I know there's investments trying to make it more intensive so it doesn't have as, you know, to spare land, um, but it's raised a lot of questions uh, whether it really has or not. Um, and if anyone's interested, I can I cite those papers as well. You know, the third, you could say, okay, yes, Reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, that most definitely is for the environment. Most of the other uh, streams of funding goes to urban areas. Um, and yes, they say they're sustainable. It's questionable whether that would count as what we would think about sustainable. And I'll explain to you why. Um, but then there's also another stream of monies that went to biodiversity and it really focused on large livestock and industry. And that was about 140 billion. So if we were to just look at those two, we're gonna be conservative and not consider the rest of it. Um, it really comes down to what do you think of how you define sustainable development? So just looking at those two uh, stream sources, that's about 15% of the monies that go towards the Amazon sustainable plan. However, 25% of the money that the rural fund 25% uh, of those projects um, were between 200,000 and 10 million hay ice. Uh, and about 55% of the total really went to large scale operations. This 55% really is not problematic. Except, in fact, FNA requires that at least 50% of funding uh, goes to small uh, operations, small holders. So this isn't, that's not too far off. But if we wanna think, not consider the sustainable development, if you question that, you could take 45%, which would be the other projects, which would be of a, a, a smaller type of a, a project and think, okay, 45% of 3 billion went to sustainable development. We know in the urban area that, and this is even more concentrated, 0.9%, 0.09% of all the projects were over 10 million hay ice. So it's 52% went to uh, very large industries. Um, are they really sustainable development? Are they really doing the environmental side? If we're looking at the small scale and the grassroots bottom up, then it becomes more problematic. And there are some studies showing, especially the ones uh, industry located in Manaus, um, they actually have some pretty uh, good green industries there. But if you want to look at 
sustainable development in terms of small scale, a smaller type of projects, more, more you know, grassroots local, about 48% of the projects would have gone to less than 10 million, even though less than 10 million is a lot. Um, so if we look at those two pools of funds and decide, okay, that would be 45% of the funding went to Amazon, um, went to sustainable development from the Amazon, or you can consider the whole, but, you know, it's, it's questionable the money actually, how sustainable and how do you determine, how do you define sustainable development? So looking at that, so out of the 199.4 billion, if we're looking at the FNAO and say, okay, we're gonna be conservative here. FNAO, it's about $3 billion during that time period went to smaller scale um, environmental operations. That would be 1.5 of the total 100 billion that was invested by the government. Or we decide we're gonna also include these other activities and say 45% of FNAO or 9 billion of that 199 billion that the government invested about 4.5%. And we can't forget that there's international monies coming to the Amazon fund was created that was part of the Amazon sustainable plan. And this allows for foreign governments to and foreign interests to put money into the Amazon and then it gets filtered through the Brazilian development bank. And mostly like the money coming from Norway would be in this pool. And if we look at during those four years, 518 million was invested or 0.259. So how much actually went towards foreign investment and in infrastructure? Well, I really don't have those numbers yet, but we're looking at it. But just to give an example, in 2019, that year alone, an estimated 500 billion went to infrastructure. That's 2.5 times what was put in this four, the whole four years under um, the Brazilian government's investments. So what is my point? Um, if you look at the investments, um, let me go back here real quick. It's not that, oh, they really aren't investing. I mean, if we looked at our own investment uh, sources, most of the monies we spend on infrastructure is much greater than what we, we spent on the environment or sustainability. It's not saying that um, that's problematic. It's the expectation that sustainable development is not the paradigm. And it, you know, it's obviously not the case. And what's more startling though is all the investments in infrastructure in the Amazon is just so much greater than the investments in sustainable development. There's a great deal of interest uh, in this regard and a great deal of investment. And it is in fact, historically been the, uh, the focus. So this is kind of a, an interesting sideline. Um, here is the Great Lakes of South America. And this is in a Hudson Institute report. And this is put out by Herman Kahn of the Hudson Institute. And this was the plan back in the 1960s to develop the region. Let's make the Great Lakes, just like the US, if we can dam all the rivers and tributaries, it will allow for, uh, yeah, transportation across the continent, transportation across the globe, and it's a strategy for development. And this seems like a, a crazy idea. Um, and it is even more crazy when you realize that Herman Kahn was the, somehow things, um, was the, the role model or the model for uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strangelove. Um, and so, yeah, these are crazy ideas, but these ideas are very consistent. And in fact, in the 1960s forward, the exact same projects that are part of URSA, um, URSA Plus are the projects that were first initially proposed by, by the government many decades ago. So the next point, my third point, um, is that in fact, sustainability and the rhetoric of sustainability has actually been very strategic for development interests. And as I said, I'm going to show this mm -hmm. by looking specifically at the, uh, the tapajos. And I do need to pull something up real quick on the other side. Since I can't look at my notes, that's what I need to see. So what in particular, so it's decentralization has been strategic. Yes, there's been decentralization. There is in fact planning and there are funds from the local and the state government. Um, but how much of that is actually going to sustainable development is, is 
questionable. In fact, most of the funding is going towards infrastructure or towards urban planning. Um, and 43% of the Brazilian Amazon is in fact in the federal uh, jurisdiction. So the, the plans of the government, and they're called the PPAs, pluriannual plans, really lay out specifically um, infrastructure and specifically URSA is the main uh, strategy. And so this is strategic for URSA. And so here is another image, which actually is nicer. And I'm sure both Mike and Aganya are, are happy to see this prettier image here. Um, so trying to remind you just quickly, um, URSA is a multi-scalar effort. As I said, it's from the national level, uh, you know, international, state level, uh, all the way down to the local level, the municipal level. There are environmental impact assessments, but because of this jurisdictional issue, uh, it becomes really problematic. Uh, the federal government has, you know, if you have a multi-state project, then it's the federal government level. If it's uh, a state project that's going to all involve the state, um, then it's a, a lesser of a environmental impact assessment and all the way down to, to the local. And the fact that these are happening at different levels, you just can't go in and go in there and say, oh, look at all these projects. Here they are. You have to get from the national government, what projects are they putting forward? You've got to go to the state level, what projects are the state level putting fro forward, all the way down to the local level, and then you have to build them all together to get this image. Uh, so this took a lot of work, um, collecting all this information, putting all this information into a form where we can actually see the magnitude of this project. Uh, and, you know, otherwise you couldn't see it. I mean, so, there has been a focus on one dam at a time, one, one project at a time, because it's not easy to find all these other projects. And I think that when you put it together, you'll really understand the magnitude uh, of what is planned here. And so I wanna really focus in on um, the Tapajos River Valley, it's this area that we, we see here. The plan from uh, Brazil's perspective is they wanna make the Tapajos Valley into the Mississippi of Brazil, a major transportation corridor. Um, for the, for the country and actually for um, the continent. And this is problematic. Here we have uh, these beautiful area. This is at the Amazon National Park. Uh, these are some uh, rapids, right? This right here is the, the center of where the project is, projects are going to be built. It's also uh, the homeland of the Munduruku people, the Mundurukanya. They lived there for you know, upward of you know, 40,000, 15,000 to 40,000 years ago. Their lands are right in the crosshairs of the plants for um, the Tapajos River Valley. And so now I'm going to kind of go through this. Here we have a, a blow, blow up, blown up picture. So it actually shows uh, better, I think, what exactly is planned. E the yellow triangles are the dams that are planned. They have about five dams that are part of the uh, Tapajos Valley complex. Um, three of the, the, the dams are necessary to build the waterway. And the real interest is to create a waterway that goes straight through the central part of the country that can actually link up to, to the Amazon. Um, and as you can see, all these other parts of the waterway, these are all different uh, areas that they're all going to connect this massive um, waterway uh, transport. Here is where we have a, um, a off and on uh, major transshipment port that's being built. And it was really strange looking at this transshipment point. We were trying to figure out, it didn't appear as though it was connected to the rivers really. It's not really that close to the river. Um, why would they build that here in the middle of nowhere? Well, the idea actually is to connect the river waterway through to the uh, federal highway system. And the way to do that, and the only way to do that is to put this municipal road in place. So when you're looking at the federal plans, you never would see the municipal road in Apiacas. You actually have to go to municipal plans. And so we actually were able to find that there's this municipal road that's going to connect the transshipment point to the federal highways and the federal highways go across the continents. And it also will allow for uh, soy 
and other types of products to come from uh, the, the Central West, the kind of heartland of soy. And the idea is that it's going to be shipped up and brought to the Itaituba Industrial Complex. And here there's these investments to put in agro-industrial um, production, food production, uh, mostly oils and such. They want to bring up the raw product, produce it in this industrial complex, and then it'd be shipped up across this waterway and out via Villa Conde and uh, Bacarena, Pará, or over to Santa Ana Amapá. So this would become a major way to bring all of the products. Um, and it's much, much cheaper to do shipment through the Amazon than to bring everything down to the south of Brazil and, uh, and, and transport from there. You also have ports. There's going to be um, 11 new, just in this area, new and upgraded uh, ports system. Um, There's also plans for railroads that you have federal railroads and you have a state railroad. Again, you wouldn't know about the state railroad unless you looked at the state planning projects, but they all connect to create this system. This is a, a large uh, railroad. So it's about, they expect the federal road is going to be about 965 kilometers. Um, and they are also going to add roadways and so there can be uh, several thousand new roadways. And the idea is that this actually connects to the other uh, cross-continental railroad. So you've got this major connected infrastructure system. Um, another problem is the mineral wealth. And so looking at um, the mineral wealth, which happens to be right in the heart of Munduruqania, the, the land of the Munduruku, it's believed that there's actually the largest gold group that has been that. So we have all this, this is a gold. It's supposed to be the largest gold. Um, and in fact, we have uh, recently uh, Valley Hiodose, which is a um, multinational, but mostly a Brazilian mining corporation has recently got permission to start exploring in this area. Um, and you also have, you know, diamonds, industrial metals, some of the, the rare metals that are necessary uh, to make much of the industrial uh, products. And so, oh, this I missed here. So the idea is not just this mineral wealth and being able to transport it, they're also building a pipeline that would go from Santarém to Marabá. And over in Marabá, they have an industrial complex. And so really the whole heart of uh, indigenous territories is like I said, it's right at the crosshairs. And you wouldn't be able to see this and know the plan unless you pieced it together. So, and the issue here is because everyone was focused on uh, decentralized and focusing on the local or or critical of these large-scale projects, they didn't see the big picture uh, of what was to come. And so we have basically this huge complex, which is underway. Um, much of the money that's being invested, international investment, is going towards building ports, uh, investing in other types of uh, mineral uh, extraction activities. Um, and so they were able to do this without the people who are concerned about sustainable development who are focusing on the local to even see it coming. So you have to have a, a larger scale idea of what's going on. So what are my conclusions, the recommendations? Um, first, I think we really need to consider the critically examine both the development rhetoric versus the material practice. That in fact, infrastructure, um, the economy has always been the priority and that national regional level planning, although they've decentralized and you do have state and local level planning, the national top down regional planning has not gone away. It's still happening. And so it really, I think, begs the question, was there a paradigm shift? And where did this paradigm shift happen? Is there really sustainable development? Some people assume is going on. Or is the modernist development paradigm still the paradigm that is alive and well? Uh, 
the second conclusion I have is that there really is an urgent need to look at the magnitude of the project. If you really wanna understand the potential impact on the environment and the people. Um, and as I was saying, I think that many of my colleagues, when they saw the big picture of what's to come, uh, they were shocked. How could this have happened? But I think it's, they were distracted and were just focusing on one project at a time and not saying how all those projects are part of the puzzle that's coming together. And so the dams, it's not just power, the dams are actually going to clear out all those rapids so they can actually make it uh, navigable. Um, and so if you want to help the local populations and the grassroots, you really need to have an idea of what is coming their way. Um, most of the, uh, telephone's ringing, um, most of the people who are looking at dams, their anti-dam projects, they were just focusing on one dam, not the big picture. And we also shouldn't underestimate the capacity of Brazil or other leaders. Um, that was another uh, comment that people had, had made, uh, concern was that, well, yeah, in the 1980s, you know, they had these plans and they never followed through with them. Um, but in fact, these plans happened going forward uh, and they just didn't realize they were moving forward because they weren't looking for them. Um, but now it's, it's coming about, uh, and also in terms of the financial capital, I know there was some uh, glimmer of hope that the economic crisis would stop these projects, that they wouldn't be able to actually uh, pursue them. But now we have so much foreign investment and the foreign investment is coming from uh, primarily governments like China and Iran, as well as multinational capital. And the amount of foreign money and investment is probably larger than the government's investments um, in those infrastructure projects. And so I believe that, you know, I'm not sure what the, what the solution is in terms of the future for Amazonia. Um, most definitely there's going to be a environmental and, and, and cultural pro threats, uh, problems. Um, it does raise the issue how Brazil can reconcile between climate commitments versus the URSA projects, reducing greenhouse gases at the same time as building these projects. Because keep in mind, it's not just going to uh, have a, a change on the actual landscape as they build these roads. It's going to allow more people to come in. It's gonna increase the population. It's gonna to shift to more industrial production, which is also going to increase the population. And so there's the, the implications are um, pretty, pretty quite amazing when you think about it. Um, there are weaknesses in the old system, you know, the top down type of approaches. But there's also problems when it comes to the newer approaches that people are, are putting forward as the solution, uh, community forest management and act, extractive economy. Um, there have been a number of projects that have been successful early on. But as the road comes, as new opportunities emerge, uh, many of the people who live in those community forest management areas, they shift and change their production. Uh, we saw that with the Chico Mendes Reserve, they went from being you know, rubber producers to being uh, cattle, to, to grazing cattle when there was uh, productivity. The third way, biodiversity as an input to innovation, possibly, uh, but there's such a technological uh, leap that has to be made to really make that happen as, as a, uh, you know, um, as they suggest. But then when we look at all the other activities and how much money is being invested in agro industry um, on the mineral extraction, can they be compatible? They may be compatible, but it becomes problematic to just assume that this is the solution. Um, and then there's the issue of payment for ecosystem, ecosystem services. And this comes back down to, you know, when you look at it economically, so you have to value, you know, nature as you would economically you know one of the main principles within this you know, notion of this kind of economic you know um, imperative is that there has to be a willingness you know to pay i mean really it is the only value nature has is what people are willing to pay what what markets are willing to pay um and depending on who is the president <laughs> depending on which way we go i mean the environment may not have much value at all and so you know banking on valuing the environment as you would economically becomes really problematic. Um, once there's a new way to sequester uh, carbon, um, some new technology, no longer does the uh, forest have any value. Um, and, you know, that make it becomes problematic. And we do have a political wave to the right across the globe. Um, 
China, Iran have fast tracked uh, their money. So if Brazil can't make the investments. There's all these other uh, funding possibilities um, emerging. And URSA seems to be being fast tracked. Now, are we going to see a shift? Because we've had some changes in the US. Is that going to give you know, rise to changes in Brazil and everything could change and go back to more of that uh, sustainable development um, discourse and, and interest in trying to really create a sustainable future, possibly. And so I'm not sure how optimistic I am. I mean, I guess the Amazon that I think people imagine may not be the Amazon that will be the outcome. I know a lot of my, my colleagues, when they come to the US, in particular Florida, they really love Florida. They love you know, the, the highways and the traffic works and you know, we got the shopping malls and green lawns and everything functions. But it's not the Florida uh, that I left in 1999 and it's not the Florida I grew up in 1970. It's not the Florida that had you know, before you know, if people moved in and in the, you know, the frontier opened in the 1900s. I mean, there were uh, species diversity has you know declined. The environment you know is being changed dramatically. Um, maybe the Amazon may become more like Florida. I don't know. That's not my point. My point is that if there's going to be an interest in, if people are interested in development and rural development, at indigenous peoples just believing in sustainable development and that paradigm shift, it's not going to necessarily have the outcome uh, that is desired. And it leaves the indigenous peoples um, high and dry. So Ipide has a movement of the uh, Munduruku. Uh, this is an area where one of our own, Mayere Gare, did her uh, PhD work. They have stood up against the government to stop them and their development plans for the Tapajos. They became empowered or emboldened after the Bamanchi, they, they fought with the other indigenous anti-dam groups there um, unsuccessfully because the dam was built. And they decided that they weren't going to keep negotiating. They're not gonna keep um, working with others to try to stop the dam. They're just gonna stop it themselves with their own direct action and their strategy of uh, negotiation and have had some luck. Um, they occupy the San Manuel Dam, several of the dam projects were halted. But there is a question, how long are they going to be halted? Um, are they going to win in the end? Um, and I'm really not sure, I'm not that optimistic um, what the outcome is gonna be. So I just want to um, thank my collaborators. Uh, in particular, I hear we have some papers that address this topic um, and my, my uh, great you know, students, um, Gani and, and Mike and Maida and Lini and Ali, all the ones who helped uh, the, these um, projects move forward. I'd like to thank them. Also, I want to point out some of the data that I got from this came from, from Portugal and Silva. And so I'm open to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. That was wonderful. And that certainly is an eye opener. Um, I, I do have a question to start out with, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Before some of these projects really uh, come to fruition in terms of being operational uh, dams and in other infrastructure, uh, I'm assuming uh, things like power lines and roads and things, before it all, uh, before it gets completed, do you think there could be another push for ecotourism in the area to try to preserve that? uh that environment uh and and show that there could be some balance that uh, perhaps before this thing gets out of hand i don't know if it already is but before it gets out of hand is it possible that ecotourism can come back as opposed to pushing them because i can see where it's going down a very heavy industrial route with mineral economy and production and it seems like uh the like you say the amazon the forest itself is undervalued and can there be a push uh, in this in this way, perhaps to hedge a little bit, so when this these projects, some of these projects come to fruition, the damage will be less. Well, 
Yes and no. I think first, just looking at the amount of mineral wealth in Amazon is just not clean. It's beyond. There's no way that they're not going to exploit those resources. I mean, we will exploit all the resources we have available to us. The amount that really brings to the economy is nothing in comparison to what they're going to get from the mill and the industrial and the amount of investments that have already been made. Um, I don't see that as you know a, a possibility that you'll have instead of the mineral and the industrial, oh, we'll do ecotourism because it doesn't mean uh, payback. Uh, there are possibilities, um, and this is something people don't like to, to, to think about. You know, the idea of community forest management um, and having these extractive reserves, they stay extractive and they stay more pristine until the roads come and other economic opportunities open up. Uh, one place, I studied the Brazil nut forest as well in the south of Pará, which is actually a really large area. I think my study area is a Brazil nut you know, area. Well, 17% of all deforestation in the Amazon happened there. So it's really a big area. And it was a concentration of um, Brazil nut trees. You have this you know, forest. It's really hard to find any pictures of what it used to look like because now, you know, it's, it's pasture for as far as the eye can see. Uh, um, it's changed or it's become that whole area within 20 years. It's now a major industrial area. It looks great. It's got shopping malls and streets. And so it has all the development, you know, you would expect of a, of a developed region or you know, urban landscape. Um, but there is a reserve. Valle Giodose has a big mining operation and they were required to put a certain amount of land into reserve. And in doing so, they actually have preserved some of the forest. Of course, it has uh, fences around it and, and there's people standing guard, but there is an aspect of, do, and it goes back to when we think about sustainable development um, and some of these notions of well, the people need to live in the forest and we need to have these community forested areas. They haven't been able to resist the shift in the economy. Um, potentially, and this is being discussed actually, if uh, he, he Dose, um, Valley Hill Dose comes in and they have a, the concessions for those, um, let me go back and share that picture. We just look at the magnitude of the, uh, I went quickly through it, but I mean, all the gold diamonds and all the resources, but there is discussion if Valley Hiadosa came in and they were to start, and I think they already are, yeah, extracting these resources and they paid a royalty to the indigenous peoples. Potentially we can think of a different type of extraction. And there is an interest on the part of the indigenous. Um, I was at a, a part of a symposium in Oxford in, in 2020, January, 2020. And they brought it up. And so the Yanomami were there and the uh, um, the Kayapo leaders were there. And they had brought up and discussed the idea of if there's going to be mineral wealth on their lands, they should at least get royalty. So maybe something different. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for that, um, but I think we need to think of it ra rather as an either or. Um, I, this is coming. I mean, there's just too much money being invested there's too much potential. If you really look at this as a geographer and you imagine all of the um, shipments, most of the shipments before that were coming, export were coming from the south of Brazil. You know, the Amazon, in you, if you create all those waterways, um, you can get to every continent. It actually makes it less expensive to ship this away from uh, Brazil if they go up the, the top of Jos. The Amazon is another waterway um, and that goes all the way across the continent. It will allow for um, the shipment of, of gold and minerals from the Andes region. And it'd be much cheaper to ship by boat across the Amazon than it would by uh, truck or train vehicle around the uh, basically the, the mountainous highways, which they had been doing. And so this isn't just Brazil and it's not just the Tapajos, it's the whole entire um, Amazon and beyond. So if I were to say I could look at a different area, whether it's in, you know, the, the Pururus or the um, other rivers in the uh, 
down towards Bolivia or up towards Ecuador, similar types of projects are underway. I think people just don't realize the extent of what's coming because they haven't put it together like we'd have in this, you know, this figure shows it all because you're able to actually pull all the pieces to see the magnitude. Um, and the investments are just so huge. So sustainable development, how we have thought about it in the past is, is an either or, uh, I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's possible. Any questions from our audience, please join in. Anybody? Running a little late, but. Yeah. It is interesting, I think back again, 20 years, when I first started working in um, in Brazil, working in the Santa Pará, you know, you had some sawmills and it was dusty, but you could see the forest. You go to, to the south of Pará, you go to Marabana, it looks like you could be in Sao Paulo. You've got, like I said, you have shopping malls, um, you've got highways and roads and uh, gay communities. Um, and it seems like it's, you know, that type of development is happening across as the basin becomes more and more integrated into the larger economies. And unfortunately, of the indigenous and some of the other traditional peoples who lie right in the path. Um, but maybe if they got royalties, they could be like the, uh, like the Seminole or the Mikasuki, you know, they get put a, uh, anyway. Wow, it's a whole other, a whole other way of looking at where the Amazon is headed. I, it's uh, it's somewhat disturbing, but I guess uh, we're, we're looking at a tipping point here. The, the investments already have been made and it's, it's headed in that direction. And it's almost seems like something that's not, not going to stop or not going to be challenged. Uh, anyway, uh, this is uh, illuminating. Thank you so much. That was just a wonderful presentation. And uh, we appreciate your research. And uh, again, look forward to your papers and insights. And thank you again for allowing us to uh, uh, view some of your research. And uh, we were very happy to have you as a speaker, Cynthia. Thank you very much. It's great to uh, have a chance. OK. Thank you, everybody, for coming down today and hanging with us. We appreciate you all. Thank you. We'll see you next week. We have a guest speaker coming. Okay. We'll see you. Okay, bye-bye.